While this 2009 indie game might be grating on the eyes and ears, it dethrones Temple of Elemental Evil from being the king of D&D-based combat systems. Knights of the Chalice was a one-man production, and it shows. But what's impressive is how this game puts the battle system of any contemporary big-budget RPG to shame. It uses the 3.5 edition D&D rule set and combines it with some of the best and most clever enemy AI seen in a turn-based tactics game, even if a lot of the behavior is scripted. Thankfully, there's an in-game help menu and plenty of tooltips to help explain how the game's mechanics work, for those who aren't familiar with the D&D rules, which you might need, as this game can be tough. There's not much in the way of story, and sadly there are only three classes and races to choose from, but the game makes up for it with its elegant, easy-to-use battle system. While it might look confusing at first, the game offers clear visual indicators for spell effects and things like chance to hit and attacks of opportunity. If you can stand the retro aesthetic, this game offers a great deal of tactical depth, inherited from the pen and paper system with details like fireballs dealing more damage to webbed enemies, and skills you don't usually see in video games like grappling enemies, five-foot steps, and empowered spells. Best of all, the enemy AI is smart enough to take advantage of things like bull rushing a character that's standing next to an area that's under the influence of a spell. It might not look like much, but any true fan of RPGs and turn-based tactics should be able to look past the primitive graphics and see the game for what it is. One of the best turn-based RPGs of the last decade. It's by no means a well-rounded production. Combat is the only thing it's got going for it, but knowing that just one guy was behind it makes you realize how depressingly lacking shiny big-budget productions like Dragon Age and The Witcher truly are. Though the saddest part is how games like this languish in obscurity while infinitely more shallow and simplistic indie games are heralded as the saviors of the gaming industry just because their creators happen to be buddies with the right people, or are loud enough in social media to draw a lot of attention to themselves. SSI's Order of the Griffin on the TurboGrafx-16 is a surprising title. Most of the Dungeons & Dragons games on consoles were horrible, but Order of the Griffin takes after Pool of Radiance, which is one of the progenitors of the tactical RPG genre and tied with Ultima V for being the best RPG made during the 80s. However, the game is not an exact recreation of the Gold Box experience. For starters, you can't create your own characters and sprites like you could in Pool of Radiance. Instead, you can pick between different pre-made characters. My guess is that SSI didn't think that console gamers could handle character creation, even though a few years later they had full character creation in Slayer on the 3DO. You might have noticed that the class system isn't an exact replica of the D&D system. There are seven different classes. Fighter, Mage, Cleric, Thief, Elf, Dwarf, and Halfling. Non-human races taking the place of classes? What? Were they reading out of the first edition D&D manuals? Once you've assembled your party, any gold box veteran should feel at home with this game. Exploration is done in first person view, while combat is from an overhead view. D&D tropes like having to memorize spells, camping, realistic loot, insta-killing sleeping and held opponents, and low health numbers are all there. The game doesn't quite capture the magic of gold box combat due to a smaller party and lack of items, but for a western console RPG made in the early 90s, this game is remarkable.
At the time, it was easily one of the deepest and mechanically best made RPGs across all 16-bit consoles. It also has better graphics than the Gold Box games, which makes navigating the towns easier as you can actually tell the different buildings apart. But it still hasn't got an auto-mapping feature, and it has some first-person dungeon crawling, so I get some RPG Street cred for that. A definite hidden gem of the Turbo Graphics library, and just overall an underrated game. If you put it against some of the more well-known Genesis and SNES RPGs of the time, Order the Griffin can easily hold its own. It's no Tactics Ogre, but again, I must emphasize that for 1992 console RPG standards, this is very good. Odium, or Gorky 17, as it's known in its native Poland, takes a lot of visual inspiration from Resident Evil. You control members of a NATO group sent on a mission to a small Polish town that's full of weird monsters. The game uses pre-rendered backgrounds that are at times quite good, though the grimy and grey industrial aesthetic that was popular in Resident Evil and Quake sequels alike isn't very pleasing to look at here either. It's a decent game, but some of the design choices are peculiar. You can only shoot straight with pistols, while the rifles you can shoot diagonally. When you level up, 1% of accuracy costs as much as a single health point. If any of your characters die, you must start the battle again. There's an emphasis on survival horror style item management, which brings the kind of tactical depth to simple situations you often see in JRPGs like Dragon Quest, as you have to make decisions between dealing more damage and dispatching an enemy quicker, or using melee attacks and taking the risk of getting hit if you don't deal enough damage to kill the enemy, which in turn means having to use your limited healing items. The game suffers from visual glitches on newer computers. Sometimes the dialogue lags and cutscenes are interlaced with the loading symbol. But I've never had actual gameplay glitches. It's nowhere near the level of quality and depth seen in Jagged Alliance 2 and Silent Storm, but the horror ambiance gives Odium some personality. It's worth a try. Oh, and the voice acting is some of the best you'll hear in a tactics game. That thing, it's, it's impossible. We are the one who caused the trouble. Guardian War isn't really a quality title. But it's worth mentioning for being one of the few RPGs on the 3DO. It's a very basic grid-based affair. Your characters have two or three subclasses, and you can have up to three abilities in each class. It's very simplistic, and there's not much actual depth to the battles. But the game stands out in my mind for its weird visual style. I've never seen any other game like it. I don't know what you call this style, but it's a bit reminiscent of Doom and other 2.5D first-person shooter games, as you have very weird-looking clay-like sprites that don't rotate on top of realistic backgrounds that loop. It's an unforgettable look, and no pun intended, I swear that the enemy are cursing you when they die. Rebel Star Tactical Command was designed by Julian Gollum, the guy behind the original XCOM, as well as the Rebel Star games on the ZX Spectrum that preceded this one. It would be interesting to know how he ended up making games for the Game Boy Advance. I guess he saw a copy of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, or Knights of Lotus, and decided to try his luck on the handheld market after the PC market started dying and it was harder to get publishers on board to fund turn-based strategy games. The game actually manages to recreate most aspects of the original XCOM's battle system, far more faithfully than the critically acclaimed reboot. You've got the AP system with a neat visualization system that lets you know how far you can run while still being able to fire a shot, Overwatch, different firing options, the ability to pick up and throw weapons, and so on. 
you're also fighting against a UFO invasion. But that's where the similarities end. There's no base building this time. Instead, the game plays more like a Japanese SRPG, with character development and story cutscenes between missions. Even the art style is very easternized. There's some nice variety between missions. Sometimes you have to be stealthy or have some other objectives you have to take care of. Add in a simple and intuitive control scheme that makes turning and seeing where your opponents are facing easy and some decent graphics and music and you've got yourself one fine Game Boy Advance title. It's not as well known as the Japanese SRPGs on the Game Boy Advance and as a result of that, it's a whole lot cheaper. A definite hidden gem of the GBA library. I won't go into too much detail on this one. Shadows of the Tusk is an interesting title for all importers for the fact that, though it was only released in Japan, all the abilities have English names. The actual game isn't very interesting though. It's too shallow, or at least suffers from the same problem that many Japanese SRPGs do. Rather than dropping you in the deep end like strategy games on the PC, it starts slowly from the basics, mission by mission. That kind of design is horrible for replayability, and if you've played any other games like it, you'll be bored out of your mind by the simplistic run-of-the-mill combat. You can set your team members on a chessboard to set their formation before battles like in Tactics Ogre, but when you start the game, you're fighting against enemy groups on a flat grid map where there's practically no room for any kind of maneuvering or tactical depth. It's such a shame that the one time there's an actual import-friendly RPG that was never released outside of Japan, it's one that's not really worth importing. If Shadows of the Tusk suffers from starting too slow, the opposite is true with this game. Knights in the Nightmare was made by Sting, who is known for their RPGs with convoluted systems, and this one definitely fits the bill. This game has over 30 minutes worth of built-in tutorial videos, and I still can't explain the mechanics. Is it a turn-based RPG? Is it a real-time strategy? It's kind of both. You use your DS stylus to avoid bullets, flip between a dark and a light world, pick up diamonds that enemies drop to restore your mana, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I don't think that I even understood what I was doing when I played this game, so I'll just leave it at that. Check it out for yourself. It might sound like a weird game to recommend, but it did receive praise for its depths and unique mechanics when it was released. If you're looking for a little less chaotic experience, there's Gungnir from the same developer. It's a more traditional grid-based tactics game, and it has a branching storyline where you get to do moral choices. Shadow Watch is an odd one, and it's truly forgotten. Seeing as there's only a single gameplay video of it on YouTube, it was made by Red Storm Entertainment, who made the Tom Clancy games. Every time you start the game, your location and even quests are randomized. There are eight different mission types, and the story and mission you start out with is random, which unfortunately makes your missions feel meaningless and interchangeable, although it allows for a wide variety of different storyline outcomes. You have a group of mercenaries at your disposal, but you can't change their weapons. Though you do get to choose how to develop them upon leveling up. I lost all of my gameplay footage when I had to reinstall Windows recently. What struck me about the game when I started recapturing the footage is how damn boring it is on the replay. Seriously, I couldn't be bothered to play it long enough to even get into a skirmish with an enemy. I was so bored by the slow XCOM-esque movement. But from what I do remember, the combats are nowhere near as thrilling and tactical as those of XCOM. You have an AP-based movement system, morale, and attacks of opportunity, but no destructible environments, nor can you make any kind of tactical decisions concerning your loadout. 
Archer. Shooting opponents does not feel satisfying. The cartoony art style really isn't doing the game any favors in this regard. Действую. Отвечайте. Заткнись. Wait. Where do I go? No. 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 The armor is gone. It hurts. I think I'm done for. Though it is one of the first Western games with a sort of cell shaded look to it. The music is pretty good at least. Heck, I could have caught that puny shot. What a puny shot. Armor took the shot. of capturing footage for this game, so I'll keep this short and sweet. Gladius was made by LucasArts, and it has a light, medium, heavy rock, paper, scissors system. It seems to have developed a small following, and receives praise for its multiplayer mode. 